Thank you for being here this morning. I really appreciated the first song. The truth of that song moved my heart. Amen? So praise the Lord for that. Turn your Bibles to Exodus chapter 4. Well, actually, we're going to be looking at, ver- at verses from chapters 4 through 11. We have a large section of Scripture here. And this passage of Scripture from 4 to 11 really zeroes in on the plagues of Egypt that Moses, that God, through Moses, brought upon the Egyptians. And as we consider these uh, passages, I just want us to have your Bibles open as we're going to look at Exodus, but uh, consider the great things that God has done here. Our first point is this, God wants willing servants. And and I just want to say one thing about this because it just uh, stood out to me as I was preparing the sermon it's, uh, I, I've always looked at the people of Israel, and remember how they were going through the wilderness, and they just kept on complaining. They just complained after this and complained after that, and wah, 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 you know, just complaining after complaining. Um, I, didn't, I didn't go and count how many times they complained, but as I was looking at Moses at the burning bush, he begins to complain as well. And honestly, I think he complains in that short space of time, he complains more than the people of Israel throughout the 40 years in the wilderness. He complained a lot. He complained so much that God actually got angry with him for complaining. And he is complaining right there to God, face to face. That, that's just kind of amazing. So uh, people of Israel, they're off the hook now. Moses is on the hook for all of his complaining. And uh, I just want us to be encouraged that when God speaks to us that we don't complain as well. There are many things that we can complain about, our health and our situations and whatever, but uh, God God knows what we're going through, and whenever He tells us to do something, He knows about it, and He knows what He's asked us, and He's promised to help us. That's what He kept on telling Moses. So, God wants willing servants. Now, the next part of the, the next part here, our next point is this, that God battles the evils of the world, and this is where I want to focus on the plagues in Egypt. And what stood out to me in this section was this, that there are a whole lot of things that God says about what He is doing through the plagues. And what stood out to me is that we often look to God and we pray to God and we want Him to do something in our lives, that one thing. And we kind of focus on that one thing Or we try to find that one thing that God is doing, when in reality, He is doing a whole lot. Now, I'm going to tell you right up front, there are nine points under this second section here. God battles the evils of the world. And these are not points that, these are points that arise directly out of the text where it talks about the plagues, nine of them. That's a lot. And that's that's when it struck me that God's not just doing one thing in the plagues, He's doing a whole lot. So God is doing something. He's talking to Moses. And he's dealing with the people of Israel. And he's dealing with the people of Egypt. And he's dealing with Pharaoh. God is doing a whole lot through the plagues. And I want us to consider some of the things that he does. Now, there are ten plagues, and here they are. I'm just going to run through them really quickly. Uh, You might have a header in your Bibles for each plague, or you may not, but they're they're there. These are ones that we're familiar with. First of all, he turns the water to blood. Do you remember that? That's kind of the first one he did. Um, and he does some other things as well, but that's the first plague there. He turns the water to blood. Blood. Then there are the frogs. Then there are the lice. Then there are the flies. Then the livestock are diseased. Then boils appear upon men. And then hail comes down from heaven. Then there's the locust plague, then there is darkness, and of course, the plague of plagues, the death of the firstborn. So those are the ten plagues. And as we consider these plagues, there are several things that God says about them as he's dealing with Moses. So we go to the first one here, and this is the first thing that stands out, to me anyways, and it is this, that God declares how it will end. God declares how it's all going to end, and He says it at the beginning. So we're back in Exodus chapter 4. So look at Exodus chapter 4. And this is before Moses has gone into Pharaoh. 
And he says this, verses 22 and 23. Then you shall say to Pharaoh, so Moses has given instructions to, to, I mean, God's given instructions to Moses. Then you shall say to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, Israel is my first, is my son, my firstborn. So I say to you, let my son go that he may serve me. But if you refuse to let him go, indeed, I will kill your son, your firstborn. So you see what God is saying to Moses before he even explains what any of the other plagues are going to be. He says right up front, this is what I want you to tell Moses. The people of Israel, they're my firstborn, and I want you to let them go. If you don't let them go, then I will take your firstborn. And that's how it ends. It ends with the death of the firstborn. That is kind of the culminating plague. But the point is this, that God has declared from the beginning how it's going to end. And you know, his declaration or understanding of the end from the beginning, that is not anything that falls outside of what God is able to do. We know God knows all things. He knows the end from the beginning. And the things that he has declared or purposed that are going to come about, they are going to come about no matter what man might do. He is sovereign, and we cannot do anything to thwart his plans. And so we know, just as the people of Egypt knew, we know how it is going to end. Back then, God plagued Egypt. But in the end, as He prepares to come, He is going to plague the world. Back then, He confronted wicked Pharaoh. But when He comes back, He will confront the devil himself and his manifestation on this earth. Back then, He delivered the people from slavery in Egypt. But even now, He has delivered us from our slavery to sin. And He has given us eternal life. And so everything that happened back then to the Egyptians, are, they are kind of foreshadowing or foretastes of the greater thing to come. And so God declares it from the beginning. And so we need not fear, we need not be worried in the midst of all of our trials and all of our tribulations and all of the turmoil that we experience. And no matter how bad things might get out there in the world, we do not need to be concerned because our God has declared the end from the beginning. We know how it will end and we are his children. And part of our responsibility is to take that message of Jesus Christ and what he has done for us and the forgiveness of sins and to proclaim it to the world so others also may escape from the judgments to come upon this world and experience the eternal life that comes through him. The second thing is this, that God prevails over worldly imitations. God prevails over worldly imitations. There's something that I often hear as, you know, we talk to one another as Christians. We uh, talk about people that we are engaged with in the world. So, you know, we say so-and-so, well, they're not a Christian, but they're so nice. You know what I'm talking about? You know some of these people out there? They're not Christian, but they're so nice. They'd be a great Christian if they would only be a Christian. Um, We might look at somebody and Uh, out there that's not saved and we might say well they're handling their difficulties so well if I could only handle it as half as well as they're handling it I'd be doing really good and they're not even Christian we might uh, look at people in the world and say well they're so generous you know they're they're just they just give so much you know I know Christians that just don't give as much as they do they are so generous they're not even Christian And something that we have to remember is we're looking at all these people in the world that seem to be acting in Christian ways, that there is the grace of God that extends to all men. It is His common grace. And so the sun rises on the good and on the wicked. The rain falls on the good and on the wicked. God is implanted within the heart, a God-centered conscience that helps people towards what is good for others and for themselves and and uh, not hurt, hurt, harmful and hurtful. And so we have our laws, and the laws often reflect biblical truths because of this conscience that God has given, and it is all by God's grace. So we should expect people to exhibit 
Christian kinds of activity and attitudes and stuff, we should expect to see that because God is at work moving in the hearts of people. Of course, though, this does not mean that they are saved just because they are walking in the grace of God. It does not mean that. They are just experiencing the grace of God. And praise the Lord for the grace of God because if it wasn't for the grace of God and people just went full full force in their sinfulness, this world would truly be a miserable place. If the devil had free reign just to rampage through the land, it would be a lot worse than it is now. But God's grace is present, and He allows the good things to come on the wicked and on the good alike. And because of it, we see these things um, demonstrated by the people of the world. But remember, they are not saved. They are not right with God just because they imitate some of the godly things. I want to use one particular account. This is in chapter 7. So turn to Exodus chapter 7. I just want to pull out one of the accounts here and go through some of these things, uh, these principles, this, this idea of imitating what God has done. And of course, this is going to be in a false uh, sort of way. I'm going to read, first of all, Exodus chapter 7, verse 10. And this is Moses, and he's before Pharaoh. Moses and Aaron are. And it says in verse 10, and this reflects the obedience of Moses and Aaron because God told them to go to Pharaoh and to do this. So in verse 10, it says this. So Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh, and they did so just as the Lord commanded. So there it is. They're doing just like God told them to do. And Aaron cast down his rod before Pharaoh and before his servants, and it became a serpent. So there is obedience on the part of God, just on the part of Moses and Aaron, just as we might be obedient in this world. So we go out and we're obedient. We do what we're supposed to do. We cast down our rod and it turns to a snake, just like God has said. However, the world is going to imitate or see a a similar thing or do a similar thing that, that we have just done, and they are going to use this as kind of their excuse. So Pharaoh's sorcerers come in, and they copy what Moses has just done by the hand of God. So in verses 11 and the beginning of verse 12, it says, But Pharaoh also called the wise men and the sorcerers, So the magicians of Egypt, they also did in like manner with their enchantments. For every man threw down his rod, and they became serpents. So there's an imitation on the part of the world that takes place when we go out and we talk about our faith. One example of this might be, well, uh, we share how Jesus forgives us of our sins, and how he helps us through the difficulties of life. And the world might retort back and say, well, you know, um, I'm not perfect, but I try to do what is good, and uh, uh, I have my own crutches. I'm just putting words in their mouth. I, I don't have to turn to God to be my crutch. I have my, my own things that I lean on. And so they come up with something that is similar to what we're going through, and at the end, there's really no distinction between what we have said and what they are saying. There's kind of this imitation that is going on. But... God's strength always prevails. God's strength always prevails. So even though, and I don't know, I mean, there's a lot of speculation to what's going on here. So even though God changes the staff to a serpent by a miraculous work, the the Egyptians and the, the sorcerers here are able to do it by their magic. They turn their their staff into serpents as well. But here it is at the end of verse 12. But Aaron's rod swallowed up their rods. And there's where we see a beginning of a distinction between the imitation of the world, the false hopes of the world, the false securities of the world, and the true work of God. The Egyptians imitated what God had done, but God had done the true work. He had done the first and foremost work. And that rod that became a serpent from Aaron's hand, swallowed up the rods, the snakes of the Egyptians. And God shows how his strength always prevails. Because any any hope or any security that is placed in anything but God will fall short in the end. 
It will fall short at some point. It will not provide the, de- the promised deliverance that is hoped for if it is not resting in God. If he's not doing the work, it will fail. Now the people of Israel, I mean the people of Egypt, Pharaoh and his servants, they have an opportunity at this point. They have seen the power of God prevail over their weak imitation efforts. They see that, and they have the opportunity to repent. But look what it says in verse 13. And Pharaoh's heart grew hard, and he did not heed them, as the Lord had said. And so we can see this in the world. No matter how we show or demonstrate or say that God prevails and will prevail in the end, that does not mean that people will respond the way that they're supposed to. And so we see it all the time, you know, when we're dealing with our family, when we're dealing with our friends, and we're dealing with our, our uh, maybe co-workers or school friends and so on. We see it all the time, how they, they, they might respond differently to the things that turn our hearts towards God. And we shouldn't be surprised by that. Unless the world is resting upon God, there is this great potential for a hardening of the heart at what God is really doing. So that's the second point. That brings us to the third point, and and it is this, that God multiplies His wonders in the earth. In Exodus chapter 11, so turn over a couple of chapters to chapter 11. I'm going to read verse 9. Exodus 11. In verse 9, it says, But the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh will not heed you, so that my wonders may be multiplied in the land of Egypt. And here, here's the point, that God multiplies his wonders in the earth. God multiplies his wonders in the earth. Now, God could have started with the death of the firstborn. He could have started it right there and just kind of ended the whole thing really quickly. Moses could have gone into Pharaoh and said, Pharaoh, God says, Israel is my firstborn. Let them go. If you don't let them go, then your firstborn will die. And you've got three days to do it. And just kind of, why go through ten plagues, right? You only need one. As a matter of fact, you don't even need one. God could have brought that pillar of cloud and fire, remember that? Which was very instrumental in the crossing of the Red Sea because when God parted the sea... He stood between the armies of Egypt and he kept them from going against the people of Israel. He just stood there between them. The sea parted. The people of Israel went through. And then he moved and the Egyptians followed and they were destroyed in the Red Sea. He could have just brought in the pillar of cloud and fire and just kind of stood it there in front of the Egyptians and said, my people are leaving. See ya. And just let them go. Right? Could have done it like that. Just one in and out. Take care, we're not coming back. But that's not what he's doing. He is multiplying his works. Remember, God is working in Moses. God is working in the people of Israel. God is working in the Egyptians. God is working in Pharaoh. He is doing a whole lot of stuff. And he is multiplying his wonders. And he is uh, accomplishing his purposes here. And so we see... uh, we see this. I want to go to the New Testament here. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. Why might God delay? Why might God do a whole lot of stuff? Why might He just extend His work a little bit longer? And this is one of those verses that came to my mind. The same principle just applied towards the end times there. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And so we see here God's love and His kindness and His mercy, His desire to see people turn to Him. He doesn't want people to die in their sins. He wants people to experience life in Jesus Christ. And so there is patience and there is long-suffering. There is a multiplication of His work over and over and over again. We were reading in Amos in our Bible study time this morning, And Amos, in one passage, uh, he goes through a whole list of things where God is saying, well, I did this, and you didn't turn to me, and I did this, and you didn't turn to me, and and I did this, and you still didn't turn to me. And five times it says, and yet you did not return to me. 
God was trying to reach out to the people of Israel over and over and over again, and they continued to rebel and reject Him. But He extends it out, and then at some point, the judgment comes. And of course, we moved on to the next section there in Amos, and it says, prepare to meet your Maker. The, the end is going to come, but in the meantime, there is grace. Another verse that came to mind was this one from Romans chapter 5, verse 20. And, uh, you know, God at any time for any sin, He could stand up and bring judgment against the sin. But notice what it says here in Romans chapter 5, verse 20. The law entered that the offense might abound. Now, now get this. Where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. Isn't that great? And it is a good thing. Because how many times have we fallen short and, have we, and we have failed? And it is God's grace. He comes to us in mercy and in loving kindness. And He continues to deal with us over an extended period of time. And so this is a, the great thing about God. He continued. He did. He did His miraculous plagues there in front of the Egyptians. And each time they had an opportunity to repent and to turn to Him. So that's how he deals with people. Our next point here, he is the God of gods. He is the God of gods. Now the people of Egypt, they're trusting in their gods. And I don't know, I came across a statement. They had up to 80 gods in the people of Egypt. You know, the people of Egypt had 80 gods there in Egypt. I don't know how you keep track of 80 gods. That's uh, uh, quite, a, quite a, an array of gods. And, but you see, what, this is what the world does. One god is not enough, you know. In the world's eyes, you got to have the God of the sun, and you got to have the God of the river, and you have to have the God of, the, of fertility, and it just kind of multiplies, right? You need a God for everything, because one God is not enough if you don't believe in the God. And so they had all of these gods, and they're trusting in all of these gods, but the judgments that come from God, He is basically just kind of removing all of their gods out of the way. There's nothing they can do to prevent what God is doing. And so we read in Exodus 9.14, it says, look at 9.14, it says, For at this time I will send all my plagues to your very heart, and on your servants and on your people, and here it is, that you may know that there is none like me in all of the earth. So they have all of these gods in all of the earth for every little thing that they need a God for. And God is saying, I am going to do this so that you might know there is none like me in all of the earth. In other words, your gods are nothing to me. He says it a little bit more explicitly, and it's kind of interesting in these last two verses that the judgment pronounced against all of the gods is kind of wrapped up in that last plague, the death of the firstborn. This is what it says in Exodus chapter 12, verse 12. It says, For I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night and will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgment. I am the Lord." Now here's the final test, the final trial, the final plague against the Egyptians. Again, they have the opportunity to turn to the God of life because all of their gods, not any of them, not all of them together, will be able to deliver them from the death of the firstborn. It will be a one-stamp judgment against it all. There is nothing you guys can do. In Numbers chapter 33, verse 4, just reflecting back on this, passage in Exodus, it says, For the Egyptians were burying all their firstborn, whom the Lord had killed among them. Also on their gods, the Lord had executed judgments. So God in His plagues against the people of Israel, they were just finding that their gods are falling short. And so with each passing plague, maybe they're thinking, well, maybe so-and-so, this God will help us. And then that didn't work out. So maybe this God will help us this time. And that didn't work out. And maybe here are some of the more important of the Egyptians God, Egyptian gods. Hathor, Ra, Osiris, Isis, Horus, Amon, Bastet, Seshat, Kebet, Anubis, or Toth. Maybe one of those gods will bring deliverance. And of course, they all failed. God said, what? You are believing in the river more than in me? Boop. What? You're putting your faith in the sun more than me? Boop. 
What? You're trusting in that bug? What is wrong with you? Well, we do the same, you know, people out there do the same thing today. We have a world full of religious vigilantes, as I like to call them, rejecting the Word of God, creating their own religion. They are rebellious and full of themselves, unwilling to humble themselves before God. They are following their own ideas rather than following the God of gods. And none of it will stand in the end. He is the God of gods, and He prevails always. Our next point here is that God wants all to know that He is God. God wants all to know that He is God. I think a lot of times we kind of walk around that, you know, God is this big secret and He's afraid to show Himself and we're afraid to declare Him. and We just kind of hold back. And we're just unsure of what He wants to do or how, you know, the idea of God proving Himself is just kind of foreign to us. We resist that. But I tell you, you read through the Scriptures, especially in this Exodus account, the opposite is true. God does not want to hold himself back in this world. He wants to be declared fully and completely before all men. And so this is what God was doing in the life of the Egyptians. He is doing all of these things so that they will know he is the Lord. So Exodus chapter 7, verse 5. If you turn to chapter 7, in verse 5 it says, The Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand on Egypt and bring out the children of Israel from among them. After seeing all of the things that God is doing, it is hard for them at the end to deny that He truly is God over all the gods of the Egyptians. Nobody comes close to Him. And He wants them to know that He is the Lord. In chapter 8, verse 10 this time, Says So he said, tomorrow, and he said, let it be according to your word, that you may know that there is no one like our God. So here's God using Pharaoh against, kind of against himself. And I love this. So the land is full of frogs. And uh, Pharaoh comes in and says, okay, I've had enough. I'll let you go or something like that. And uh, Moses says, when do you want the frogs to disappear? You tell me when. Moses, I mean, Pharaoh says, tomorrow. And he says, okay, tomorrow they're going to be gone. And when it happens, you're going to know that he is the God of gods. And it happened. Tomorrow they were gone. But of course, Pharaoh hardened his heart. Exodus chapter 9, verse 16, just reflects an important truth here. It says in 9, 16, but indeed, now this is speaking about Pharaoh. Indeed, for this purpose, I have raised you up, Pharaoh, that I may show my power in you and that my name may be declared in all the earth. Now, this is a tough verse because it focuses on God's sovereignty and his decision to use one vessel unto destruction, if you will, in order to show his greatness in the rest of the people. This passage is quoted in Romans chapter 9, verse 17. And it says, for the scripture says to the Pharaoh, for this very purpose I have raised you up that I may show my power in you and that my name may be declared in all the earth. And we see here what God wants to do is to have his name proclaimed in all of the earth. And I tell you that we are a part of that today. He has called us, like he called Moses, to declare his truth in all the world. And he is doing great things in our lives that everyone might know that he is the Lord. And so let us arise, O church, and open our mouths and live for Christ in this godless and sin-filled world, a world that worships all these other gods. We have the truth and let us speak it in love so that others may come to know him. Our next point here is that God wants people to learn the fear of the Lord. God wants people to learn the fear of the Lord. So in Exodus chapter 9, verses 20 and 21, it 
says, now this is the plague of the hail. Moses declared that hail was going to fall on the land and every, anything that was left out from shelter was going to be destroyed. So here's what it says in chapter 9 of Exodus, verse 20. He who feared the word of the Lord among the servants of Pharaoh made his servants and his livestock flee to the houses. But he who did not regard the word of the Lord left his servants and his livestock in the field. And of course, they were killed because of it. The purpose is this. God has now given the opportunity to the people of Egypt in the midst of all of these plagues. In this particular plague, the plague of hail, they had the opportunity to show their fear of the Lord and to protect themselves from the plague. It was not a given that every uh, livestock of all of the Egyptians was going to die. It was declared, and those who feared the Lord took action and protected themselves while those who did not perished. And this is, this is the testimony that we have as the church. Nothing has changed. In John, 1 John chapter 5, there's this amazing verse. And this is God the Father. He gives the testimony of His Son. He says, this is the testimony. And here it is. This is the message that goes out into the world today. Just like the message of the hail back then. That God has given us eternal life. And this life is in His Son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. So there's the message, there's the testimony. Who will fear the Lord? Who will heed the message? Who will yield themselves to Jesus, the Son of God, and receive the forgiveness of sin? To those who have the fear of the Lord, they will escape death. They will have eternal life. Those who do not heed the message, those who do not fear the Lord, they will perish. Our next point is this. The Lord distinguishes between His people and the others. Now, this is kind of amazing here. Something that we don't often remember is that the first couple of plagues not only impacted the Egyptians, but it also impacted the people of Israel as well. There was no distinction. The plague just fell upon all the people. Some time ago when we were studying the great tribulation in the book of Revelation, we talked about tribulation. And us as believers, while we're in this world, we might experience some hardships. I mean, I don't know if there's anybody in here who, who is not experiencing a hardship or who has not experienced a hardship. We will experience hardship for just by, the fact, by virtue of the fact that we are here in this world. But there comes a point where the Lord makes a distinction between His people and the rest of the people. And so we see this coming out in Exodus chapter 9. And it says, the hail struck throughout the land of Egypt, all that was in the field, both man and beast. And the hail struck every herb of the field and broke every tree of the field. Only in, in the land of Goshen, where the children of Israel were, there was no hail. There was no hail at all. God made a distinction. He gave an opportunity to the Egyptians to escape it, and those who didn't perished. But the hail didn't even fall upon the people of God. In Exodus chapter 11, verses 6 and 7, it says, Then there shall be a great cry throughout all the land of Egypt, such as was not like it before, nor shall be like it again. But against none of the children of Israel shall a dog move its tongue against man or beast, that you may know that the Lord does make a difference between the Egyptians and Israel. He does make a distinction. There is a difference between us as God's children and the rest of the world. Now for us, it's, kind of hard to see that sometimes. This honestly is a part of my prayer every day. And it's hard for us to see it all the time. But there's coming a day, and we know it this way, where He will separate the wheat from the chaff, right? And in that day, He will make a distinction between those who belong to Him and the rest of the world. There are some in our world today that want to say that all paths, all religions lead to God. Everyone will be okay. That is not the truth. There is a distinction between those who believe in Jesus and those who do not. People who do not believe in Him are not okay. They will perish in their sins. It is imperative that a person yields themselves to Jesus, humbling themselves before the cross, confessing their sins, and allowing Him to come in and to work in their heart. That must take place. That is the only way. There is no other name under heaven by which men shall be saved. It is Jesus who saves, and only Jesus. The world doesn't like that. They say, wow, what makes you so special? That's so exclusivistic. And uh, maybe there's some truth to that. But really, 
the truth is this, that God gives the opportunity to all men everywhere who has ever lived to come to faith in him. Everyone has the same opportunity. Next point here, God is looking for true repentance, not remorse. In Exodus chapter 9, verse 27, Pharaoh says this a couple of times at the end of the plague. Pharaoh sent and called for Moses and Aaron and said to them, I have sinned this time. The Lord is righteous, and my people and I are wicked. What a great confession, right? I have sinned. The Lord is righteous, and my people and I are wicked. That is a great confession, except for one problem. He did not mean it. And there again we find that it's not just the words that come out of the mouth, but there must be this heartfelt repentance against our sin or from our sin or of our sin. We must repent and we must come to Him to be saved. Just because we know the right words to speak and just because we know the right things to do does not mean that we are right with God. And so Pharaoh said the right things in order to get what he wanted but he did not really believe any of it. His heart was hard towards God. God is looking for true repentance, not just remorse or regret over something. And that brings us to our last point here. God establishes a legacy and a testimony. And this is pretty, pretty amazing. God, like I said, is working in the people of Israel, and this is what he wants them to do. He wants them to tell what he has done. Exodus chapter 10, verses 1 and 2 says, Now the Lord said to Moses, Go into Pharaoh. I have hardened his heart and the hearts of his servants, that I may show these signs of mine before him, and that you may tell in the hearing of your son and your son's son the mighty things I have done in Egypt, and my signs which I have done among them, that you may know that I am the Lord. And so here, here it is for us, folks, that we tell What God has done in our lives that we tell our children and we tell our grandchildren. How many of you, has God done something in your life? How many of you, God has done something in your life? Take all the things that God has done in your life and tell them to your children. Tell them to your grandchildren. That is why, one of the reasons why He is doing these things so that we might proclaim forth the legacy of His work in our lives. So let us speak of it. Let us tell the world what Jesus has done. We are now the mouthpieces of God in this world. The world is full of sin and it is dying, but we have the message of life. And if we proclaim that life, some will be saved. And that is God's will. And so let us do it. Our third point this morning, and I only need 15 more minutes, I am just kidding. I am not going to talk about this last point. God plunders his enemies. You'll have to come back tonight because I do. This, this, is, this, this was new to me. So we're going to talk about this tonight a little bit. God willing. We'll also talk about God hardening Pharaoh's heart and Pharaoh hardening his heart. We'll just touch upon that in our kind of uh, casual de- devotion time uh, this evening, Sunday night. So come on up. We're going to sing our last song here. If you have a prayer request, come on up. And I would encourage you, for all of us, that we would humble ourselves, that we would call on the God of gods. He is able to deliver.